Chapter 17 The Deer Tribe by H. A. Bryden Deer represent as a family the non-domesticated class of ruminants. Generally speaking, the males are distinguished by antlers, which are shed periodically, usually once a year, and again renewed. Comprising as it does some of the noblest mammals to be found on the face of the earth, this large and important tribe is to be found distributed over a large portion of the world's surface. From the Arctic North, the home of the wild reindeer, to Patagonia in southern South America. Deer are, however, not found in the continent of Africa south of the Sahara, nor in Madagascar or Australia. They are not indigenous to New Zealand, but the red deer, introduced there some years ago for purposes of sport, have thriven wonderfully well and are now completely acclimatized. From the earliest times, deer, especially those species known as the true or typical deer, of which red deer may be said to be a type, have been animals of considerable importance to mankind. Their flesh has always been eagerly sought after. Deer skin is still, even in these days of high civilization, useful for many purposes. And the antlers are almost equally in request. It is more than probable that, in the vast and still little explored regions of central, east, and northern Asia, new species of deer remain to be discovered. At the present time, there are known to exist, in various parts of the world, close on a hundred species and varieties. Within the space allotted to these animals, it is, of course, manifestly impossible to notice all these in anything like detail. Many of the varieties or subspecies closely resemble one another, so much so that the differences between them are only apparent to the eyes of naturalists or acute observers. The Reindeer Reindeer are distinguished from all other kinds of deer by the fact that antlers are borne by both males and females. The antlers, as may be seen by the illustration, differ materially from those of the red deer, elk, and other species. The brow tines, especially, are often much palmated. These animals are heavily built, short-legged, and as beseems dwellers in a snowy habitat, provided with round, short, and spreading hoofs. For ages, reindeer have been domesticated by the laps of Scandinavia, the Samoyeds, and other primitive races of northern Europe and Asia. Trained to harness and drawing a sledge, they traverse long distances, while their milk, flesh, and hides are of great importance to the people who keep them. The common, or Scandinavian, reindeer ranges from Norway through northern Europe into Asia, though how far eastward is not yet accurately determined. It is interesting to note that these animals were once denizens of Britain, and so lately as the 12th century, the Jarls of Orkney are believed to have been in the habit of crossing to the mainland for the purpose of hunting them in the wilds of Caithness. Wild reindeer are still to be found in the remoter parts of Norway, though, from much persecution, they are becoming comparatively scarce in most parts of the country. Mr. Abel Chapman, in his Wild Norway, gives some excellent accounts of sport with these fine deer. Speaking of a good herd of 21, discovered in Rafilka, he says, Most of the deer were lying down, but both the big stags stood upright in dreamy, inert postures. I now fully realized what a truly magnificent animal I had before me. Both in body and horn he was a giant, and his coat was no less remarkable. The neck was pure white, and beneath it a shaggy mane hung down a foot in length. This white neck was set off by the dark head in front and the rich glossy brown of his robe behind. Besides this, the contrasting black and white bars on flanks and stern were conspicuously clean-cut and defined, and the long and massive antlers showed a splendid recurved sweep, surmounted by branch-like tines, all clean. For three long, agonizing hours, the stalker watched this noble prize, and then one of those lucky chances which occasionally gladdened the hunter's heart occurred. 
and the reindeer approached within a hundred yards. Half a dozen forward steps and his white neck and dark shoulder were beautifully exposed. Already, ere his head had appeared, the rifle had been shifted over, and now the foresight dwelt lovingly on a thrice refined aim. The 450 bullet struck to an inch, just where the shaggy mane joined the brown shoulder. The beast winced all over, but neither moved nor fell. A moment's survey, and I knew by the swaying of his head that he was mine. The weight of this big reindeer stag was estimated at 450 pounds, or 32 stone. He carried 25 points to his antlers, which measured 51 inches in extreme length. In addition to the common or Scandinavian reindeer, there are closely allied races, showing, however, slightly varying characteristics, found in Spitsbergen and Greenland. In North America, where only wild reindeer are found, these animals are known as caribou. Here several subspecies are known, among them the Newfoundland caribou, the woodland caribou of the mainland, and the barren ground caribou found in the arctic wastes of the far northwest towards the polar ocean. The elk or moose. This gigantic creature, the largest of all the numerous tribe of deer, is found in the old world in northern Europe, Siberia and northern China. Its range extends, for there is no real distinction between the elk of the old and the new worlds, to northern America where it is always known as the moose. Its transatlantic habitat runs from the mouth of the Mackenzie River to the St. Lawrence. Wherever its abiding place may be, it will be found that the elk is essentially a forest-loving creature, partial to the loneliest stretches of the woods and dreary marshes. Its fleshy, bulbous, prehensile muzzle shows plainly that the elk is a browsing beast and not a grazing animal like most other deer. The male carries vast palmated horns, measuring sometimes as much as six feet one and a quarter inch in span from tip to tip. This measurement is from an American specimen in the possession of the Duke of Westminster. A fine Scandinavian bull will measure 18 hands at the withers and weigh as much as 90 stone, while the North American elk is said to attain as much as 1,400 pounds. In color, the elk is a dark brownish-gray. The neck, body, and tail are short, while the animal stands very high upon the legs. Under the throat of the male hangs a singular appendage, a sort of tassel of hair and skin, known to American hunters as the bell. The build of the elk is clumsy, and the mighty beast entirely lacks the grace characteristic of so many others of the deer kind. It has, in truth, a strangely primeval, old-world aspect, and seems rather to belong to prehistoric ages than to modern times. In Scandinavia, elk are hunted usually in two ways, by driving or with a trained dog held in leash. In the royal forests of Sweden, great bags are made at these drives, and in the year 1885, when a great hunt was got up for the present King of England, 49 elk were slain. Except during the rutting season, these titanic deer are extremely shy and suspicious creatures, and the greatest precautions have to be taken in hunting them. In Canada, moose are often shot during the rutting season by calling, a rude horn of birch bark being used, with which the hunter simulates the weird hoarse roar of the animals as they call to one another, or challenge in the primeval woodlands and morasses of the wild north. Still hunting, or tracking, spooring as it would be called in South Africa, is another and extremely fatiguing method. While yet another mode of hunting is that practiced by Indian and half-breed hunters in winter, when, the sportsman being mounted on snowshoes, the moose is followed, run into and shot in deep snow. In this sport, the hunter has much the better of it. The moose, with its vast weight and sharp hoofs, plunges through the frozen snow crust, over which the snowshoes carry the biped easily enough, and, becoming presently exhausted, is shot without much difficulty.
Elk usually run at a steady slinging trot and traverse extraordinary distances, apparently with little fatigue. Red Deer We come now to a group of what are called typical deer, the red deer, found in various parts of the world. The red deer, which once roamed over much of Britain, is now in the wild state confined chiefly to the highlands of Scotland, Exmoor, part of County Kerry in Ireland, and various islands on the west coast of Scotland. A good male specimen will stand about four feet or a little less at the shoulder, carry antlers bearing 12 or 14 points, and weigh from 10 to 20 stone clean, that is, with the heart, liver, and lungs taken out. The woodland stags of Perthshire, however, not infrequently reach 25 stone, while Mr. J. G. Millay mentions a stag killed by Colonel the Honorable Alistair Fraser at Beaufort, Invernessshire, which scaled 30 stone 2 pounds clean. This seems to be the heaviest British wild stag of modern times. The summer coat is short, shining, and reddish-brown in hue. In winter, the pelage is thicker and rougher and grayish-brown in color. Stalking the red deer stag in its native fastnesses is beyond all doubt the finest wild sport now left to the inhabitants of these islands. Mr. J. G. Millay, author of British Deer and Their Horns, and other works, himself a first-rate sportsman in many parts of the world, compares the style of shooting red deer in vogue 40 or 50 years ago with that obtaining in the highlands at the present day. A stalker in Black Mount, Argyleshire, he says, told me of a typical day's sport in which he took part some 40 years ago. Fox Maul and Sir Edwin Landseer were the two rifles. They frequently stalked in pairs at that time. And, on the side of Clashven, Peter Robertson, the head forester, brought them within 80 yards of two exceptionally fine stags. Maul fired and missed as did also Sir Edwin as the stags moved away. Then, on a signal from Robertson, Peter McCall, the ghillie, slipped the hounds, the two best ever owned by the late Marquis of Bredelben, and whose portraits are still preserved in the famous picture of the Deer Drive. And away they went in hot pursuit of the deer. An end-on chase now ensued, the line taken being due east down the Great Glen towards Loch Dockert, and at last the stalkers were brought to a standstill, being fairly exhausted both in wind and limb. At this moment, however, four dark spots, like small rocks, standing out at the point of a little promontory in the lake, attracted their attention. And on drawing nearer, they saw, to their surprise, each of the big stags being held at bay by a gallant hound. A couple of shots then settled the business, and so ended what was then considered a grand day's sport. No doubt it was most exciting to see the struggle of bone and sinew between two such noble quadrupeds, but it was not rifle shooting. Today the gallant but disturbing deer hound has given place to the cunning and obedient collie, and the success of the stalker depends, for the most part, on the accuracy of his rifle and his skill in using it. Here are a couple of sketches of modern stalking taken from Mr. Millay's own diary. Wednesday, October 4th. Started for the big quarry with McCall, and saw nothing till we got to the Eagle Hill. On this were three stags and about twenty hinds, the property of a magnificent fellow carrying one of the best heads I have ever seen on Black Mount. For some time McCall thought he was just a bit too good to shoot, for the very best in this forest are generally left for stock purposes. Finding, however, that he was not royal, a twelve-pointer, my companion agreed to a shot. That is, if he got within shooting distance, which was not too likely, the Eagle Hill being one of those queer places where back eddies are carried down from almost every ert from which the wind is blowing. Luck is apparently entirely my way this week, so far at any rate. The big stag was very kittle, frequently roaring and keeping his hinds moving before him along the hillside, in the direction of another quarry running at right angles, 
the entrance to which, if reached, would checkmate us. A quick stiff climb and a clashing piece of stalking on the part of McCall brought us in front of the herd only just in time. For I had hardly got into position when the first few hinds moved past a hundred yards below us. They were very uneasy and highly suspicious, but fortunately did not stop. And in another moment, to my joy, the big stag came slowly behind them and offered a fair broadside in the very spot where I should have wished him to stand. The bullet took him through the ribs, certainly a trifle too far back, but he gave in at once and rolled 150 yards down the hill, fortunately without hurting his horns. A really fine highland stag in his prime, weight 16 stone 2 pounds, with a good wild head of 10 points and good cups on the top. Thursday, October 5th. We negotiated the stiff climb, and McLeish, leaving me behind a rock on the summit, returned some distance to signal directions to the pony man. He came back just as the stag returned, roaring down the pass he had ascended. And as the mist was blotting out the landscape, I feared he would come right on to us without being seen, but, as luck would have it, he stopped and recommenced bellowing within seventy yards. I never heard a stag make such a row, but nothing of him could we see. It was most exciting, lying flat on a slab of rock, hoping devoutly that the mist would rise, if only for a few seconds. The tension had grown extreme, when there was a momentary lift in the gloom, and I made out the dim forms of the deer, just as a big hind, which I had not noticed, bruaked loudly within twenty yards of us. The outline of the stag was barely visible when, after carefully aiming, I pressed the trigger, knowing that a moment later there would be no second chance. At the shot the deer at once disappeared, but I felt sure I had hit him, and on following the tracks for some fifty yards, there he lay, as dead as a doornail. Weight, thirteen stone, six pounds. A wild head of ten points, thin, and evidently that of a deer on the decline. In England, the wild red deer are hunted with staghounds on Exmoor, and first-rate sport is obtained on the great moorlands of Somerset and Devon. During the last fifty years, the deer have much increased in numbers, and no less than three packs. The Devon and Somerset, Sir John Heathcote Amory's, and Mr. Peter Ormrod's are now engaged in hunting them. In the five years ending in 1892, 276 deer were killed by the Devon and Somerset hounds. The young of the red deer are in Europe usually dropped in June. The fawn is dexterously concealed by the hind amid the heather, and is left in concealment during the day. Scrope, a great authority on these animals, states that the hind induces her fawn to lie down by pressure of the nose. It will never stir or lift up its head the whole of the day unless you come right upon it, as I have often done. It lies like a dog with its nose to its tail. The hind, however, although she often separates herself from the young fawn, does not lose sight of its welfare, but remains at a distance to windward and goes to its succor in case of an attack of the wild cat or fox or any other powerful vermin. On the continent, far finer examples of red deer are to be found than in the British Isles, and the antlers and records of weights preserved at the castle of Moritzburg in Saxony and elsewhere show that 200 years ago the stags of Germany were far superior even to those of the present day, which are much heavier and afford finer trophies than do the highland red deer. Even in Germany, however, marked deterioration has taken place during the last two centuries. A stag, for example, killed by the Elector of Saxony in 1646, weighed not less than 61 stone 11 pounds while from the elector's records between 1611 and 1656, it appears that 59 stags exceeded 56 stone, 651 exceeded 48 stone, 2,679 exceeded 40 stone, and 4,139 exceeded 32 stone. 
These figures are given by Mr. W. A. Bailey Groman, a distinguished sportsman, in a very interesting chapter contributed to the big game shooting volumes of the Badminton Library. This deterioration among the red deer of the forests of Central and Northern Europe is, however, not traceable among the red deer of the wild mountainous regions of Austria-Hungary and Southeastern Europe. Here, at the present day, stags of enormous size and weight are still to be found. In the Carpathian Alps, for example, red deer stags are still to be shot scaling more than 40 stone clean in weight. Climate and feeding have, of course, much to do with the weight of stags and the size and beauty of their antlers. The Carpathian stags have enormous range, rich food, and, as Mr. Bailey Groman points out, are suffered during the summer to make undisturbed raids upon the rich agricultural valleys. The feudal sway exercised by the great territorial magnates permitting the deer to trespass upon the crops with impunity and thus grow to be the lustiest of their race. In addition to the British islands, the red deer of Europe is found on the island of Hitterin on the western coast of Norway, in the south of Sweden, and in Germany, Russia, France, Spain, Austria-Hungary, Turkey, and Greece. In Corsica and Sardinia, a local and smaller race is found, probably closely allied to the stag of North Africa. The Barbary stag is somewhat smaller than its first cousin of Europe, and carries antlers which usually lack the second or bez time. The color of this stag is a dark sepia brown, a little lighter and grayer on the back. Faint yellowish spots can occasionally be distinguished on the fur in the adults, says Sir Harry Johnston. The hinds are of the same color as the stags, but lack the gray tint on the back. These fine deer are found in Algeria and Tunis, their habitat being chiefly in pine and cork forests. They are found also in parts of Morocco, near the frontiers of Algeria and Tunis, where their range extends from near the Mediterranean to the verge of the Sahara Desert. Formerly, the Barbary stag was hunted by the Arabs on horseback by the aid of greyhounds. In Tunis, where it is protected by the French, it is now fairly abundant. End of section 50